From Classical WETA in Washington, we take you behind the music. In this episode, I'm joined by Classical WETA host Bill Bukowski, and we're talking about one of the most colorful genres in classical music, the symphonic poem. So discover what they are, who invented them, and some of our favorites. I also try to outsmart Bill, who happens to be one of the most knowledgeable people I know in classical music. Bill, have you ever heard a flock of sheep as angry as that? Well, they don't sound happy. Definitely not. That's from Don Quixote, a symphonic poem by Richard Strauss. And, you know, I was thinking earlier, do you remember those toys uh, where you pull on the string and then it spins around and it says, and the cow says? Oh, yes. Can, yes. If that was the sheep sound with that, <laughs> I think I would be very afraid of sheep. Uh, now. Very afraid of that toy. Exactly. Well, this is coming from Don Quixote by Richard Strauss, and it is a symphonic poem. That's one example. And we're going to get into more of Strauss in a little bit, but I guess we can kind of just figure out, well, what is a symphonic poem? Briefly, a symphonic poem is a piece of music that's a reflection on another work of art. It could be you know, very descriptive or it could just be sort of a, an impression. It could be a reflection on a book, a novel, a painting, a poem, a concept, an idea, even the life of the average uh, Joseph going about his business with his family. It's bringing it into sound. Um, And it's doing it in a way, well, it's not new, right, when we think of, well, portraying something in sound. If we go back to the 1700s with Vivaldi, he depicts things like dogs in the Four Seasons. Yeah, or a storm. I mean, this this isn't unusual. There have been composers from Vivaldi's time and even before that have used music to depict a, a certain thing. But the symphonic poem is something a little grander. It calls for larger forces and, to use the art comparison, a bigger musical canvas. Because, well, with the Four Seasons, those are concerto, something for a soloist and and orchestra. With a symphonic poem, it's not a symphony in the sense that it is in, you know, four movements right. and it has a strict form. There is something called sonata form. and we're Exactly. Gonna, no rules. And that's exactly no rules. But so for sonata form, we'll do a whole episode on that. But it's kind of like a, a set of rules, a guide for kind of how you can approach a symphony. You can think of it like almost with poetry, you know, syllables in a haiku. I am, the whole thing, yeah. Yeah. So here, composers are free of that. They're able to kind of, as you said, just jump in with a blank canvas. It comes from the Romantic era in art when and anything goes, so to speak. And you could, uh, you could tell a story over a long arc of time. You could add more details into a painting. You could make, uh, in art, for example, you could make the mountains taller than they normally are. The idea is to create something that touches the people in the heart and in the soul. Music is the same way. A symphonic poem does just that. And what composer does this start with? Basically, the first uh, symphonic poem as such was from Franz Liszt. He sort of invented it. And his, uh, his first work as such was called Les Preludes, in which was inspired by a poem. Uh, The lines go something like, what is life but a a series of preludes to the inevitable uh, final note, which is death. sounds kind of grim, but uh, not exactly, because in all that time, there's lots of different adventures that a person can have over a life. And Franz Liszt tried to depict that concept and that idea in this open-ended symphonic poem, this symphonic portrait. And this is in 1854 when Franz Liszt writes Les Preludes. So let's jump into that a little bit. The first one is question. Here's an example of of how that sounds. And what you're hearing here is kind of a simple tune. And this is the key to get into a symphonic poem is listen to that tune and sort of hum it to yourself, sort of think about it and then remember it because what he's going to do with that, he's going to use that as the germ of the idea that's going to be varied and changed and developed and, you know, as the piece moves on. And it's not so exact in that, oh, this is a question like, hey, what did you eat for dinner right. kind of thing. Uh, but when, when I listen to that the first time, it's like, well, as you really think about it and you kind of hum it, it's a statement 
it seems like it's more of a statement than a question, but when you start listening to it, it's incomplete. Right. And it's, it's, it's bold, but you're right. It's incomplete. Like, what's next? What happens next? And the next section is love. It's true. You don't need to know all this stuff to enjoy the music. But even if I didn't know, I would think something romantic here. Right. Exactly. Exactly that. And you're also hearing that little theme that we heard first sort of bubbling underneath yeah. just to remind you where we're going. And it can be several kinds of love. When I hear that, I think of like, you know, we're gazing across the room or, or in a field. We can't quite touch, but there is that love connection going on there. Right. Imagine yourself on a favorite vacation and a vista before you. Hmm. 1854, that's when Le Prelude is written by Franz Liszt. And we can kind of explore how this goes um, through the decades up until, I think, you know, where we just started with um, Don Quixote by Strauss in 1897. There is a beautiful one that is very, very popular, and that is uh, a work by Bedrick Smetna Moldau coming from Mavlos, meaning my homeland, right? My country. Uh, each of the movements is a particular part of Czech culture, geography, or history. And just so you know, the Moldau is a river. It's the main river that flows through the Czech Republic. And like every river, it has a source, a start, a spring up in the mountains somewhere. The spring becomes a stream, becomes a creek, becomes a river, becomes a rivulet, a river, and then finally this, this, this massive river moving its way through the Czech countryside and uh, in the instance of this particular place, a Czech history. So in the music that we're hearing it, like we're almost in this river. We're following it from its source all the way out, essentially, even towards the end of the piece, all the way out to sea. And what this really reminds me of, we'll go back to the 1700s here, um, how Smedna and the music, da, 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 it's kind of all these fast notes going back and forth. I was listening the other day to Vivaldi's The Four Seasons, and in the beginning, in the first concerto, the spring concerto, there is a moment where you are hearing these murmuring streams. Sounds much the same, doesn't it? Right. I don't think it's too much of a stretch you hear. No. I feel like I'm on a leaf and I'm going around in this little stream, In the perhaps. eddies and streams in the flow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but there, that's an absolutely beautiful piece by uh, Smedna. That's in 1874, and they're depicting the landscape. And we can go into a few years later in 1880 with a work by Alexander Borodin in the steppes of Central Asia. Now, this is a landscape kind of scene being depicted here, right? Yeah, and it's it's a it's a contrast from the one that we heard before. A river sort of flows and turns and twists and gets uh, and churns and what have you. In the case of the steppes of Central Asia, it's just flat land for miles around with nothing out there to see. It's a very static landscape. So what happens when you're out there? Not a whole lot, but in the case of the steppes of Central Asia, what he's depicting is a caravan off in the distance, moving closer, closer, but then moving off into the vast distances again. It's really a depiction of a wide open space. And there's sort of that Middle Eastern feel to it. Like think uh, Scheherazade, for example. Yeah. You know, this Middle Eastern car this caravan from the east moving across the steppes of Central Asia. And with that one especially, I'm getting a sense of I'm, I'm looking out across this very, very flat plain, almost when I think desert-like, how it's kind of wavy in the distance. I'll, I'll play that again because you hear the violins. That they're playing very, very high, just this long note. And it's kind of like that... Um, hazy desert sound you get, I think, when you're looking far off into the distance.
it's beautiful. Right. Kind of a musical vanishing point if you want to look at it that way. Yeah. And there's, of course, a traveling. So there is this traveling theme within um, the work as well. Now when I hear stuff like that, I think Monty Python <laughs> with the coconut shells. And that's their... right. That's right. This, this wide open landscape with just a few people and animals on it. You're right. Let's take a break. And when we come back, one of the masters of the symphonic poem genre. Classical Breakdown is made possible by Classical WETA. Join us for the music anytime, day or night. To listen live, just go to our website, classicalweta.org, or download our app. It's free in the App Store. So far, we've had poems and uh, landscapes depicted in the music, and we have a novel here with Don Quixote by Richard Strauss depicted within his symphonic poem. Strauss is a composer who it's so much fun to listen to it, but it's almost like eating a lot of candy. His music is so descriptive and so... He I've... once claimed that he could set anything to music, and he very nearly did set just about anything and everything to music. And I think he actually did say, I, if I wanted the orchestra to sound like a knife, spoon, and fork... He could do it. He would make the orchestra sound like a knife, spoon, and fork. So we already heard the sheep in the beginning from this. He also depicts horses, right, flying through the air. It's all whimsical and with right. wind machine in the orchestra as well. And the percussion, they're rolling this kind of this paper on a drum that gets rolled and it sounds like wind. Right, yeah. And this is um, in contrast to the scary story that we had before. This, of course, the being the first comic novel in history, Don Quixote. And uh, this uh, crazy man, his knightly errand and his adventures with his uh, faithful sidekick, Sancho Panza, all depicted in music here using the various different instruments that Richard Strauss had at his disposal. This is one that's just so much fun to listen to because you literally hear all of these characters coming in and out of the music with their very specific themes, and it's like you are experiencing the novel um, very, very intently or precisely right, within the music. Right. Here is this knightly character, Don Quixote, his theme. Very knightly sounding. Very knightly sounding, very noble, and just a little crotchety and old and creaky, too. Yeah. Which was Don Quixote. And his assistant, Sancho Panza, was um, not as knightly, right? He wasn't this... He's the comic relief. He's the comic relief. Here is how he's portrayed. I feel bad about the instruments he's using to do this because they're great instruments, but the euphonium, which is like a small tuba, right. and then the bass clarinet, and then the viola. And those are all instruments that have enough jokes about them <laughs> that they don't need the Sancho Panza theme. But it's so... It's perfect because it um, it's very expressive and it's just right for the character. <laughs> Now we're in 1897. There is another symphonic poem that's really popular, and that's Sergei Rachmaninoff's Isle of the Dead. This, is, um, this was written in 1908, and this one is actually of a painting, but not the exact painting, right? This is a depiction of what was a reproduction of a painting. So he's actually looking at a black and white picture. Right, a black and white picture of a painting by Arnold Buchlin that he saw, I can't remember where, but he saw that, and I think in black and white, it made the idea of the Isle of the Dead, this uh, place that the ferryman is rowing the soul across, much more dark and horrifying. He uh, said later when he saw the painting in color, it sort of changed his impression a little bit, but this was after the music was composed.
can hear the oars sort of dipping in the water as the boat is heading its way across the uh, river Styx. Exactly. I mean, it really does sound like that. And it sounds like you're going to this imposing, monstrous rock in the, in the, in the sea. Right. And I agree with Rachmaninoff. When you look at the black and white one, it looks so scary and nightmarish. And when you look at the, the actual painting and color... It looks to me like somebody going to an island in Greece or something. It's two guys in a boat. Exactly. Going on their to way island. to this, this, this wonderful-looking island. It's, it's a different uh, impression, let's say. But thankfully, Rachmaninoff saw it in black and white at first. Um, these are all fantastic symphonic poems. This is 1908. This is also the time when the symphonic poem starts to really kind of wane in its own popularity. It kind of fell out of fashion after this point. Yeah, music was changing, as it always does, down through history. And and even in the early years of the 20th century, um, things were changing. And a lot of it was like, well, we've done that already. What's next? What's new? What's the next thing to do? Now, what do you think about uh, George Gershwin's An American in Paris? It's a perfect example of a symphonic poem, actually. Mm-hmm. When, you, when you come right down to it, much later, and also uh, using a different kind of music as sort of a starting point, the music of jazz. When I listen to it, whenever I think about it, I actually never think about symphonic poem. It feels like it's almost its own thing because it's a little bit later, but it is a symphonic poem. Right. The, the rules had been changed, in essence. Um, the other thing, too, that came up at this time was sound in movies, where you needed music and an orchestration, a soundtrack to, to the pictures that you were seeing on the screen. So the idea of a symphonic poem was not anything new at this particular point. It was established. Composers already know now that they can go wherever they want and do whatever they want. Now, I have one more thing, Bill because I consider you to be one of the most knowledgeable people in classical music that I know. Uh Uh-oh. We've got symphonic poems about poetry, landscapes, uh, paintings, um, you know, an American in Paris. There is another symphonic poem by an American composer, Fair de Grofe. Do you know about this one, Knut Rockne? Hmm. Newt Rockney, All-American. Yes, the great uh, football player and coach. Okay. I was hoping you wouldn't even know about that guy because I didn't. Knut yeah. Rockney is, he died in 1931. Like, like He's considered to be the greatest college um, football coach of all time. Right. And he was a professional um, football player. Grofe wrote a symphonic poem on him. I had no idea. It's called Knut Rockney. I cannot find a single recording of it anywhere, almost any information, but I found on some universities audio library, like some kind of internal PDF catalog, I found there's some recording out there of it, but he wrote a actual symphonic poem on this football player, uh-huh. 1931. I had no idea. Well, I got you there. <laughs> uh, do you have anything else for symphonic poems, maybe one that is really deserving of you know, someone's attention? Well, not that I can think of off the bat, but there may be pieces of music that you hear that are favorite pieces of music on your own that depicts something. Aaron Copland's uh, Appalachian Spring, for example, which he didn't actually set out to depict Appalachian Spring. It was something else entirely. Or Rodeo, the ballet Rodeo. A lot of ballet music, in in essence, is depicting images and things happening on stage. Uh, The ballets of Tchaikovsky. All of these things are depicting action in one sense or another. Absolutely. And I would say also check out Strauss and his many symphonic poems. Yes, in his many, very many. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown. If you have ideas for episodes, comments, or just want to tell me why you love classical music, send me an email at classicalbreakdown at weta.org. You can also find out more about symphonic poems on the show notes page at classicalbreakdown.org. I'm John Banther. Thanks for listening to Classical Breakdown from Classical WETA.